everybody. Welcome to another episode of The Comic Source. I have Mark Wade joining me today. The man needs no introduction. He's a legend. Uh, and more than that, as a creator, he's a fan. He's one of us. So a lot of confidence. We're super excited for Absolute Power. Uh, we did the preview uh, episode uh, a little while back. Hopefully you guys all check that out. Uh, but let me ask you this, Mark. I get this sense. Uh, it's almost like a, a dichotomous event here. There's so much of it that feels like a classic crossover. And on the other half, it feels like a villain spotlight with this trinity of evil you've come up with, Amanda Waller, Failsafe, uh, Brainiac Queen, uh, specifically Waller. Talk a little bit uh, about that. Do you, do you get the same feeling uh, about yeah, that? Yeah, uh, I, I do. I I will be the first to admit that I am the only person I know, I'm the only writer I know who doesn't subscribe to the theory that villains are always more fun to write. I just like writing heroes more. So in... A lot of my stories, I will be the first to admit that sometimes, sometimes the villains are not as three-dimensional as they could possibly be. So this was this was an attempt to correct. This was an attempt to course correct and really get into the heads of Waller and Failsafe and Brainiac Queen and really get a sense of what they want, what they're after, what's going to satisfy them. And I think I have a pretty good handle on that, which I think is showing in the work. You know, when it comes to Amanda Waller, she's almost become this divisive figure. Started out, you know, more on the heroic side. Right. She's taken this journey over decades of being yeah, it's, out and out it, villain. I, it's just it. I mean, she's not a mustache twirling cliche villain. She still, she still thinks she's right. But here's the thing. I mean, it's the heel turn makes sense to me in this in in the in the, given that she's been trying to control and curb and and get some measure of you know, a hold on superhuman activity for a long long time and nothing she's done has worked so it's really time for her to just try a different tactic try going a little further cross some lines that she hadn't been willing to cross before and she genuinely believes that She's making the world a better place by doing this, but boy, she is willing to cross some dark lines to do it. Yeah, she she really is. Uh, she's becoming one of those characters, I think, that people love to hate. Uh, yeah. that That's better than people don't even care about her, right? Like, Oh, people, much better. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's better to, you know, I, you'd rather be wanted for murder, murder than not be wanted at all, you know? Yes, so. exactly. Exactly. Uh, well, we did see in... Um, I think it was in the the free comic book day, or it might be coming up in the in the prelude one shot. How Amanda and the Brainiac Queen got together. Uh, we heard recently uh, in Batman that Failsafe has gone missing, uh, his body, what have you. But we haven't seen uh, how her and, uh, or rather, he, the, the construct, mm -hmm. and Amanda really connected and started down this path. Is that something that's going to be uh, explored in a one shot or, or in one of the stories? Yeah, we, we've got that covered somewhere. So it's the, the, the connection between the two of them and how that starts. Okay. Cause I am uh, sort of curious. We had that free comic book day uh, uh, one shot. Hopefully everybody got a chance to pick that up and see uh, where does that f fit in with the story? Cause it, it sort of seems like it's maybe not right at the beginning, uh, but just to give, People kind of a, a taste, it, and it was fantastic art by Kellyanne uh, as well. It's it's still before the story starts, but it would it happens around the same exact time as the Absolute Power Ground Zero issue that comes out next week. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, uh, and that one's uh, fantastic, and it's going to tell you everything you Thanks. need to know if you haven't been following everybody. Uh, one of the other things that we've seen hints of, or will see hints of, in, in the first issue, is this idea that you know not every super uh, hero has powers. You know, right. it was, uh, Amanda trying to take away the powers. Could we possibly see a situation where almost like a civil war, where you see some of the heroes that don't have powers, maybe kind of get Amanda's point? There are a couple of characters that that to them, they are a little more sympathetic to Amanda's point of view. There is not many because it's a really it's hard to justify the the ends that she's or it's hard to justify the means right. that she's taking to get to the ends but certainly there's one non-superpowered character who clearly very much believes in her mission and it's one of those things too where if this is somebody that's been around for a long time again we don't want to spoil it but it's kind of like the whole time i'm going to be wondering is he really on her side or yeah. does he have another well, I mean, here's the, what I think. I think that Amanda has, 
you know, access to telepaths, access to all sorts of things. It would be, I think it would be very, very difficult to lie to Amanda Waller, I would think. That's true. Yeah. Dreamer on her side, kind of see the future is another uh, asset she has. So uh, this big event, everybody's going to run through the end of September, uh, come out the other side in October. So many times we hear these events, okay, nothing will ever be the same uh, again. Uh, Right. Let me just add, you know, in broad terms, what do you hope that the DC universe looks like on the other side of this? I think there will be consequences of this. The good news is I get to I get to decide what a lot of those consequences are. That feels good. So and I get to follow through on a lot of the stuff. But um, I can think of at least three big ones. Uh, And a a fourth one that just came up 30 minutes ago was as I was waiting for this interview to start. and I had an idea. So there will be. There will be characters who will not be changed, but there will be a lot of characters who are changed. There will be some characters that are who are changed forever. Um, some very surprising characters, just because the powers the powers may or may not come back, and if they do come back, they may not always come back to the place they started. Um, so there is that. There is also, you know, the idea floating in that first issue that, you know, if the Justice League had been around and active, maybe this wouldn't have happened. And that's all I can say about that. Yeah, it's a good point. The other thing is uh, kind of the civilian aspect of it, right? Like we see in the first issue, uh, kind, of, kind of surprisingly, uh, Amanda is is able to to kind of do things and, and get public support in, in a way. On the other hand, we have, you know, Lois Lane and the, the friends, the kind of the supporting cast of these heroes that are always going to be in their corner and rightfully so. Coming out of the other side of this, what's the sense of – you know, kind of the general populace, is the trust built back up? Is it going to take a while? Is, does it remain to be seen? What can you tell us about that? It, it's going to take a little while. I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie to you and say it's going to be, you know, years before the, they earn the trust back because that's frankly, that's just not the motor that drives the DC universe. Right. Heroes, mistrust of heroes is a motor that drives other superhero universes better than it drives the, the DC universe. But that said, there will have to be some, some measures taken and some acts taken to help rebuild trust in the, in the superheroes. Cool. So, uh, you know, I'm kind of touching on what, what we're going to look at on the other side. Maybe it's a little cart before, uh, you know, ahead of the horse or what have you. Um, but in terms of how everything is, uh, at in this particular moment have you written everything are you you know and there's a lot of other collaborators we're going to talk about in a a second uh, other people that you're working with and what have you uh and i know you're a veteran writer so you always leave room to to kind of adjust so where are you in in the process of this is it already all locked in are you still no you were you were a riot you were a stitch (laughs) um in a perfect world it is but we do not live in a perfect world and the the reality of how big this thing has become was not something I was prepared for when I wrote issue one. So yeah. there, you know, there's a little bit of stage fright with the back half of three and, and four, but everything's coming along nicely. And I had the incentive of having to keep up with Dan, who does two pages a day like clockwork. So I there's only so much sitting around and staring in space I can do, man. But that said, the basic beats are, are all locked down. Enough is locked down for the writers of doing, you know, who, who are doing some of the other spinoffs. And I think that the, I think so the, the big brush strokes are there. Yeah. But it does leave you, uh, if you do come up with a good idea, like you just said, you know, 30 minutes right. ago, there's room to, to make adjustments. I got really excited about the one I had five minutes ago. It was like, oh my God, that's, I didn't see that coming. But yes, we can totally do something with that. Well, wow, that's fantastic. And again, I think it keeps it fun for you, keeps it fresh yeah. for a long time. You always want to keep pushing yourself. Yeah. And you mentioned uh, Dan Mora. That was the, kind of the next on my list to, to yeah. talk about here. He, he's got such a, a sense of the classic. You know, we talked about this feeling like a classic uh, crossover. His art is so clean. What's the yeah. collaboration process been like with him? Because you had a long run with him on World's Finest before. Yeah. This event. And Shazam, doing Shazam with him. Yeah. It's been It's been great. I mean, he's... He is eager to draw anything and everything, which I find insane. I mean, I'm, I'm constantly apologizing to him for having, you know, especially in this thing, having 15 characters on one page. And he's like, you left out 16, 17 and 18. We can put them in too. God bless him. Um, 
there's such an energy he brings and there's such a sense of menace that he brings that is not as obvious in world's finest because the tone is different, Mm -hmm. but here I think you can see literally see a shift in tone in his work that is really helped by, by the amazing colors by please hold. I just want to make sure I get his name exactly right. And it is, as I suspected, it is Alejandro Sanchez. I thought so, but I've given wrong names before. So his his work on this book is really elevating what Dan is already doing. Yeah, it's you know, I'm glad you mentioned that. That that's the perfect word for it, the sense of menace, because we yeah. feel that in in the first issue. Uh, you know, so many times we're reading the stories and yeah, there's a threat to one of the heroes, a uh, formidable villain they're going up against. But in the back of your mind, you're ah, they got this. Yeah. But not so no. much. Not so much. I, this. I, I went out of my way to close every exit, to seal off every possible route of, of uh, you know, escape. I worked overtime to make sure that when you get to that climax, there is no hope. There's just no hope whatsoever. Yeah, and I'm not going to spoil it for you, everybody, but Batman's trying to figure out what Amanda's doing, and then when he figures it out, and it's kind of further along or further maybe past the line, and he, the line he gives was just thank, awesome. Thank you. So good. Thank you, like, yeah. That, that was like a holy shit line. That was great. <laughs> it's just, it's, you know, it's Batman's, this is everyone's, look, everyone has the same character flaw. All of us do. We all assume that everybody thinks the way we do, and that does not happen. So no, not, not at all. That is not the case here. Well, uh, you've mentioned it. I've mentioned it. Some of these other uh, one shots and series that are going on, just a who's who of, of really talented writers. You got Leah Williams, you got Jeremy Adams, Chip Zdarsky, uh, Joshua Williamson. Yeah. What's the collaboration been like? I mean, to, for lack of a better term, you're kind of show running it, but I mean, these guys know what they're doing, right? So well, it's, it's exactly. Exactly. And also I've sat on the other side of that desk I and mean, I, I know what it's like to be the tie in guy. So, I, you know, my goal was to be as un, 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 unobtrusive as I, you know, to, to be as hands off as I possibly could. Like, just here's a couple of boxes that I'd like you to tick mm-hmm. because the the planning part of it is that I really and and with the help of my editors, my collaborators and so forth, my my the other writers, the idea was to make sure that every book has something specific to accomplish that will help in the finale that will help pay everything off. There is no book out there that is just a, a a cash grab by slapping the words absolute power on the cover. I didn't, I don't want that. I want every issue, every, every single comic you buy to have some specific purpose that will either show you something that you didn't know or bring something back in a treasure hunt sense or, or give you some angle on Waller or whatever that you didn't know before. So all of them, you can get, yes, you can get a enti- an, an entire story by reading Absolute Power and just Absolute Power. But if you really want the big story, I, you know, the that's the big story. Right. And everyone's been great. Everyone has been, again, if all I've said is, here's what I need this Amazo to do in this issue, you run with it. Then everybody has run with it, you know? That's fantastic. Uh, I've been really impressed. We, you know, we've uh, we covered every, all the DC books every week, DC Spotlight. I've been really impressed with Nicole Maines, you know, not, not a writer yeah. by, by trade, um, yeah. but just has really embraced this and, and become fantastic. Uh, yeah. And, and you, she's got uh, a story in, in kind of the prelude issue uh, mm-hmm. and has a real good handle on who Dreamer is as a character. You find that to be the case? Yeah, and to the point where I had not anticipated Dreamer being a big part of the story, but guess what? She is because it Nicole has made her into such an interesting character. And there, you know, John, Dreamer, Nightwing, this was originally envisioned by me as a Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman driven thing. Mm-hmm. And it still is for the first couple of issues or so, but they've got their own stuff to do. They've got their own side missions that are specific to the story. So being able to sort of take them off the board for most of issue three gives me a real chance to, to elevate some of these other characters. And it surprises me how, how they've sort of come in and dictated to me 
what their role in the story is going to be. Wow, that's uh, that's awesome. The other writer I specifically wanted to ask you about co- collaborating with, uh, he did an absolutely brilliant job on other history of the DC universe. I can't think of anybody better to give us kind of the, the secret origin uh, of Amanda Waller for those maybe not familiar, kind of bring up to speed and, and introduce that sympathetic part, you know, so we kind of understand John Ridley. Uh, is- oh my God, what a gift, yeah. what a gift. This, he, he understood the assignment and ran with it you know, brilliantly took it across the finish line. It's the whole of the, the only box I needed him to tick was she's not a mustache twirling supervillain. Why is she like this? And I had some ideas, but he's, you know, more than any of the other writers, he's certainly earned enough, you know, he's earned enough credit to just, do what he needs to do is, and, and he's hitting all the, he's, he's hitting all the bases. He's rounding all the bases and it's just terrific. His insights into her and the, the facets to the, he adds to her origin are perfectly organic and uh, they really help underscore what a menace she is, but at the same time that she thinks she's doing the right thing. Yeah, when I found out he was writing it, I have I've disliked Amanda for for quite a while, right, you know, yeah. rightfully so. I thought if anybody can make me kind of understand why she makes the decisions that she makes, yeah. it could be John Ridley. Yeah, the other history of the DC universe was really nice work, yeah. and this is this is of a par. Fantastic. Uh, well, last thing I have for you, you mentioned them before these Amazo robots that we've seen uh, images of Last Sun, Depth Charge, Jade Stone. They just look so cool. They do. Uh, how much fun was it coming up with these ideas for these different kind of uh, Amazo robots that are specific to go up against sp- specific heroes? To be honest, that is almost all of that is Paul Kaminsky, the editor, Matthew Levine, the assistant, and Dan Mora. Like, all I said was Army of Amazos. And mm-hmm. they took that baton and ran with it and came back with, no, this is even cooler. You've got, you know, seven individual looking ones based on the original seven Justice Leaguers. That is pretty awesome. So, that was that was a pleasant surprise. I love working with other creators and other collaborators who bring stuff to the table I never even saw coming. Yeah, that's the joy of of comics, right? It doesn't happen yeah. in any other medium. You're you've got so much on your plate running this thing, and yeah. so to be able to give them that and they come back with a fantastic idea, then it feeds yeah. your creative energies. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Well. Thanks so much for the time, Mark. Uh, it's you been bet. fantastic chatting. Super excited for uh, Absolute Power. And everybody, don't worry. We're going to be doing individual spotlights for all the issues uh, coming up on the comic source. So, uh, Mark, uh, if people want to follow along with your work, let them know where the best place uh, to follow you online. You can follow me on uh, on Instagram at Mark Wade Writer. You can follow me at uh, on Facebook because I'm old. Uh, you can follow me at markwade.com, although I don't update that as, well, as much as I should. Uh, Blue Sky, Mark Wade. You can find me around. Fantastic. Well, again, thanks for the time, Mark. I uh, really appreciate it. Of course. Take care. You can find the Comic Source podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, or whichever podcasting app you prefer. Please tell all your friends about us, subscribe, and rate us. The ratings really help with our visibility and our ability to reach new listeners, especially five star reviews on Apple. Also be sure to visit us at lrmonline.com to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover all our other great pop culture content. If you want to email us, the email address is thecomicsourceblog at gmail.com, or you can follow us on Twitter, twitter.com forward slash thecomicsource. Do a search for The Comic Source on Facebook and Instagram to follow us on those social platforms. All three spots are great places to find out when we release new episodes as well as follow all our convention coverage. So once again, we want to thank everyone for listening, and we'll talk to you next time.